Adopt Technologies, The Elephant in the Room podcast brings you gigantic tech stories that inspire. These are creators, innovators, and change makers. Every episode, our guests embody one of the core values that makes Adopt so different from every other tech company. Much like an elephant, guests on this show are emotionally intelligent and ready to make a gigantic impact on the world. And we have another amazing guest in the studio. Dr. Timiebi Aganaba is a specialist in science and technology policy and a thought leader. She is an assistant professor in the School for the Future of Innovation in Society with a courtesy appointment at the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law at Arizona State University. Timmy, as I've been given permission to call you, because whenever you have a doctor in front of your name, I never like to dumb it down, but you said that was okay. Timmy was executive director at the World Space Week Association, coordinating global response to the UN declaration that World Space Week should be celebrated October 4th through 10th annually. She produced and hosted the 12th episode Ladies Do Launch podcast and launched the Space Governance Lab concept in 2020. I I mean, I just scaled down your resume. I just want people to know that it was much longer, but welcome. And thank you for being here. It is my pleasure and my honor to do something locally in Arizona. So I'm so excited to be here. Because you are a global figure. And I I mean, your voice is so impactful. I want to dig in right now with, uh, let's talk about World Space Week. And the theme this year was women in space. What does that mean? Right. So World Space Week in 1999, the United Nations got together and they made a declaration and they said, you know what? We really need space and the benefits of space to be spread out all across the world. So they decided, okay, from October 4th to October 10th, October 4th was when the first Sputnik, the first satellite went into space. For that whole week, all across the world, people will celebrate however they want to the benefits and the beauty of space. So in 2016, I was the executive director of the association that was established to basically help support that global goal. And so we had 90 national coordinators around the world in different countries that would organize events in their country. And we would basically come up with the different themes. We have a board of directors that includes Elon Musk. He was on the board um, and basically come up with different themes to help everyone celebrate space. So this year it was Women in Space, which we know right now with everything that's been happening, all the social movements, movements, everything, we really need to highlight specific people, even though people say all lives matter, you know, everyone is important. But there are some times where you need to highlight because people have not been given their props, right? And basically, this was the year to celebrate what have women been doing in space? And why is it important to talk about their achievements? So for me, obviously, as a woman in space, and as a black woman in space, you know, I'm not trying to say I'm special, but I'm trying to say when we look at the achievements of, say, black women in space, and you see all the barriers that they've had to overcome to get to where they've got to, you realize it really is an inspiring thing and something that we should celebrate. So how, how did you come to this career? I mean, how, how this is so interesting where you are complex, intelligent, accomplished. I mean, tell us a little bit more about your story. Right. So I fell into space. Um, <laughs> I was, you know, a lot of people in my world are Star Trek fans and Star Wars fans and Apollo, you know, the first moon landing in the 1960s. And they love all that. But that wasn't me. Um, when I was 15, my dad actually took me to NASA. And when you look at all the pictures, I'm like frowning. I'm like a typical 15 year old. This is so boring. I don't want to <laughs> be here. And then, you know, when I was 24, I decided to take a leap of faith and go to law school in Africa, in Nigeria. And this was really a strange thing to do because I was born and raised in the UK and my family were like, why do you want to be an African lawyer? It doesn't make sense. But I really thought it would be a life changing experience. And when I went to Nigeria to law school, when you graduate, you have to do a year's service for the country. So they post you somewhere in the country. And I was posted as the first hire in legal affairs and international corporation at the Nigerian Space Agency. So I knew nothing about space except that one trip to NASA. And here I was 
you know, 24 years old, the first hire with the director, having to write Nigeria's positions on what we should do about space junk, you know, how we should help Nigeria develop space capacity, launch capacity, how we should increase space education in the country. And it really just blew my mind. And, you know, but after one year, I decided I needed more education. So I went to France to the International Space University, believe it or not, that exists. And when I got there, I found out that I was some kind of unicorn because I was, I'm British and I'm Canadian and I, and I, I'm from Africa and from space in Africa and started in Africa and no one had really met anyone like that. So all of a sudden it was like, here's this person that is a South and West that can actually talk to scientists and engineers, but is a lawyer. So I really found out that I was something unique and special and I just went with it. After that, I was like, yes, this is the place where I can actually have an impact in the world, do something for my region, you know, and and really make a difference. So that's how I got into space. And then from there, because I'm lucky that I have three nationalities, I've been able to work in different countries for the Europeans, for the Canadians, and now here in the U.S. I mean, your your resume is so beyond cool. <laughs> Dude, I mean, and you're not, you're a young person. Mm. So have you felt along the way um, that you faced like looking at, wow, what I'm doing is really big and mm. it's really groundbreaking as a woman, as an African-American woman, or have you just gone with it? You know, the truth of the matter is, I think most of the time, if we're really, really honest, we are the biggest barriers to ourselves. And you know, I think that if I, most of the time, it would be my own self-limiting beliefs that would stop me from doing things. And I would be like, I can't do this. No one really actively puts things in your way to say that you can't do things. So like people who have that mentality that there's no barrier here, I'm just going to go, even though obviously there are literal barriers. But if you have the mentality that there is not, that is going to help you kind of significantly. And so what I find is that I have a few things in my favor. People tend to like the accent because they're like, oh, you, it have is a good British, accent. you have a British accent. <laughs> so people want to hear me talk. And I just capitalize on what are my strengths? I think that's very important. Yes, we should realize our weaknesses and we should make them better. But why don't we live in the world of our strengths and say, I'm good at this and identify early. What are you good at? And just dive into that. And if you do that, people can't help but see you shine. And so, and then, you know, they will want to elevate you because they're always looking for people to elevate. Yes. This is the thing for, for me as a black woman, you know, and, and I hope I don't have any haters for saying this, but I think people are always looking for black women to elevate, right? Like people think that as a black woman, yes, you are at the bottom of the totem pole, but they have to showcase black women. And so why can't I be that black woman that gets showcased? That's the mentality I have. Every room I walk into, I'm going to be that black woman that gets showcased. I'm going to be the one that makes a difference. I'm going to be the one that everyone remembers. If you go in the room with that mentality rather than I'm, you know, going to be discriminated against. Nobody wants to hear my perspective. You already come with a presence that makes you get elevated. So or, I think that's basically how I got to where I got to. I love that. Or even if you're, you know, a white man, if you walk in thinking, you know, I'm just sort of going to blend in, I, it's more of the same. Mm -hmm. you're, you're saying, you know, realize that you you have a voice. Mm -hmm. Use that voice and be exceptional in what you're doing. Exactly. Exactly. I, I, lo I love it. And you were listening and we have to tell tell the listeners and the viewers um you, this morning you were talking about uh, a motivational seminar and listening to some um a podcast on the way here that kind of furthers your view in positivity yes it's 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 really interesting because you know i think we're so caught up in ourselves. On the one hand, I think it's really important to be focused on understanding who you are, you know, leaning into yourself and being very grounded in yourself. But I think it's also important to come out of yourself and realize that it's not all about you. And lots of people are going through lots of different things. Like it may have nothing to do with you, the way somebody else reacts. And so one of the important questions or the important things that I gained this morning from a training I did on having difficult conversations was asking the question, you know, um, um, help me understand why you feel that way. 
So, so basically, without making judgments, just listen to people. And even if you don't agree, just that act of sitting and listening and having a conversation that says, I'm willing to understand your perspective, just means that you maintain relationships rather than try and breaking them down. And I think if we all went through, like if we all went through today, just basically every encounter that we had, just being like, let me understand that from your perspective, we would get along a lot better. I love that. And I think it's so important. And, you know, it's, it, to me, is especially significant coming from someone who comes from the world of academia, um, because there, there can be an elitism in that um, because you are highly intelligent and you're studying all the time. But what I love about your work is that you do want to make it accessible and attainable. When you're talking about space and you're trying to talk to people about the space exploration and the bigger vision. How do you make people, you know, connect with that? Right. And how do you allow them to understand what in the world you're talking about? And it's an important question. And it's an interesting question that you put to someone that has five degrees. Right. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so you know, it's like when you when you are born into that, you have your value placed in that. Right. Like your education precedes you and all those things. But when you listen to people like Steve Harvey and you listen to people who have done very well, you realize that those metrics that we use of success that come from external things actually don't mean anything in the grand scheme of things. So yes, I have five degrees, but if nobody can understand anything that I say, if nobody's interested to like sit and have a coffee with me, what does it even mean? Right. Right. So like, I think it's very important that you realize that that is just one facet of who you are, but that is not how you interact and integrate, you know, your values or even the ideas that you want to move forward with people. You have to come down or come up to the level in the pr which the person you want to communicate is, right? That's the place where magic is going to happen. Yes. Not you trying to be above someone or yes. or something like that. So, so you know, I, I feel blessed that I have this kind of personality that means it's easy to talk. Yes. And I think that... And the accent. And the accent helps. <laughs> and and but the realization that I just because I have five degrees, some people could even say, well, you just hid behind going to school. Right. Like most people your age were doing things at 30. You are still in school. Right. So it's just, you know, it depends on who you're with and where you are, what people value. But really understanding the room that you're in, the presence and what you want to get out of a specific situation, I think is really important. And academia, I think you have a lot of people who are hiding behind kind of titles and labels and things like that. And they probably need to get out more. <laughs> right. I mean, you want your work to mean something. I love this. I love you brought up Steve Harvey mm -hmm. because he does, he knows how to connect with people. Mm -hmm. Talk about your work at ASU and the innovative work you're doing there. Yeah. So I've been at ASU for three years and I tell you it's ranked number one for innovation because they basically make it their mantra to try and make things happen. So whereas a lot of places you work or you go to, you have an idea and then there's like a barrier. At ASU, they actively try to bring down those barriers. So one of the big things that we have at ASU is we are the lead for a close to $1 billion mission to the first metallic asteroid, which could be potentially worth trillions of dollars. So I think when they decided, okay, we could be opening up a new space economy worth trillions of dollars, we probably need a lawyer around. <laughs> but they could have taken some kind of capitalistic you know, but they took an African space lawyer because it's kind of like, OK, if we're going to unearth this new global economy, we should think about who benefits. We should think about who is at the table. And probably an African space lawyer might have a different kind of insight about what equity means, about what fairness means, about what justice means. So for me, just the fact that they hired me just was like, they really talk the talk and walk the walk of like being innovative in the things that they do. Yes. So the work that I've been doing, I set up this, trying to set up this space governance lab, which is basically a way to talk about 
all the non-technical issues of space. So who should be involved? What should we be talking about? How do we think about strategy? How do we think about financing? How do we think about the legal regimes that, that figure out who owns what in space? Or how do we, one of the newest projects I'm working on is how do we bring down this very global concept of space right down to the local economies? And this is one of the reasons I was really interested to talk to you and do something in Arizona, because yes, I've been very global, but I really believe in the mantra, think global, act local. Mm. So like, yes, it's great to have this global mindset, but if your neighbor doesn't benefit, what's the point, right? If if everyone comes to you and says, oh, space, that's something way out there that has nothing to do with me. Have you really achieved anything? Right. So now I'm thinking, how do I translate all these concepts, very global concepts that I talk about, like space debris and space exploitation and space resources? Why should the local boy in Arizona, the local girl in Nigeria, why should those people care? That's really the work that I'm focused on right now. Well, that probably does come a lot from where you've trained. Mm -hmm. and that you've been all around the world and you've been in depressed economies. And so you don't come at it from an elitist point of view. Mm -hmm. I mean, space is something you're, what I'm hearing from you is that you're trying to make it explainable and understandable. And when you talk about your mission there and you ta you you um you were with the SETI Institute and is that is that how I say it? So I I'm on the scientific advisory board of the SETI Institute. Perfect. Yes. So on the website there it reads um where will you be when we find life beyond earth. Mm. So what does that mean? Yeah. <laughs> so it's really funny when they called me because when they called me to join their science advisory board, because I'm like, here I am, the most down to earth person. I'm, I come from Africa, like the most down to earth kind of person in the space sector you can find. And the SETI Institute, who are famous for extraterrestrial life and, and, and looking at the astrophysics and all this stuff, are asking me to be one of their advisors. And so it did blow me away because I was like, I've not thought about other planets or whether there's aliens or things like that. And for me as an African, it sounds almost like a joke, right? Like I think a lot of people would say, why are you spending money on like trying to communicate with extraterrestrial life or something like that? But when they, when I looked at what they did, they do a variety of different things. That is just the one that they're most famous for. But they do a lot of scientific exploration. And I really realized that the pro that scientific exploration moves humanity forward. So whatever kind of science questions you have that move us forward, that explain things, that can get people excited is actually important work. And if we do believe that there is a potential for man or humanity to explore the universe at large, we need to understand that universe that we're talking about. And that matters for everyone, not just the elitist scientist in a lab at, at Berkeley University. That means that even the young girl in Africa in the farm can look up to the stars and say, what is my place in this universe? Why should I care about it? And what does it mean to me? And I think that's why they brought me along, because they wanted somebody that gives them that insight into how do we talk broadly to society and how do we get them to really understand that this matters? It's not just a bunch of Star Trek fans who are like, are we speaking to aliens? But it's really, what are the big questions in society? What do we need to understand? And why should we keep pushing ourselves to keep trying to understand? So what do you think the listeners and viewers should grab onto today? Um, what is your message about that, about even exploring what we've all even thought about? Yeah. So, I mean, I think that the first thing is that nothing nothing is beyond us trying to explore and understand. So I think that it can seem like if something is too big or if something is for someone else or not for me, that it, you, you don't need to think about it. Someone else will think about it. But there's a role for each and every one of us to basically say... I can contribute to this conversation. And the, the the lifelong quest is to figure out how can I contribute to the conversation, right? Because it can be weird to sit here and for me to be like, yeah, you can contribute to SETI's exploration of the galaxy. Maybe you can't, but it's supposed to inspire you that even things that seem completely unreachable or beyond us 
are not because it's the art of those incremental steps that mean that you're moving us forward. And even if you feel like in my sphere, in my little world, I can't do that. As a mother, for instance, the biggest thing that I learned is that with all this global stuff that I've done, my sphere of influence is the greatest thing I'm ever gonna do, mm-hmm. right? Like how I raise my daughter to be a strong woman, to contribute to the world, to you know, to see that she should have goals, to explore further. I get that desire from thinking big and thinking, you know, yes, I've got this global vision, but it's gonna be implemented by the people around me that I inspire. So, so that's the really big thing. Like you can have an outsized influence based on the people around you that you inspire, even if you're not going to another galaxy. And, you know, this podcast is all about uh, tech stories that inspire, gigantic tech stories that inspire. Do you consider yourself to be a role model as a woman in tech Mm. and uh, innovation and your role? I mean, how do you reflect upon yourself? Yeah. I mean, it's difficult to call yourself a role model. Um, It's interesting because, like, do you need to have followers to be a role model? Like, do you need, do you need, it's probably easier to say who is following me rather than am I a role model? Because um, a role model would be like, what is the behavior that people are actually doing, which I can't control, but I can see who is following me and I can see, you know, what is the impact of what I'm doing? So would I, do people follow me? Yes. As a professor, I have young people that look up to me. I have students from all around the world who, especially from Africa, who say, oh my goodness, I can't believe you've done all these things. I want to do them too. You have a great responsibility. And the challenge with that is that when you have such a unique profile as myself, you have this challenge of whether you say to people, you can do it too because you don't wanna give people any false hope. I mean, it's very like, my path is not followable, but at the same time, you don't wanna limit people. And so as soon as I see some young boy from Uganda and I'm like, oh my God, is he gonna be able to get a space job? Probably not. But the fact that he found me, the fact that he's never been taught anything about space, but he's dreaming about it, means he's gonna get somewhere regardless of what he does. So my job is just to say, whatever it is that you do, I'm gonna encourage you and motivate you, even if you don't get a space job, even if you're not doing that thing, you're gonna reach the highest of your potential. So. So in terms of being a role model, I don't want to call myself a role model, but I will say that people do follow me. So I do feel that sense of responsibility that your life is like a mirror that people hold themselves up to. And if you say that people can do things, then they believe that they can. Do you feel that that's more pronounced because you are a woman and because you're an African-American woman? Um, The truth of the matter is, you know, Identity politics is something that I learned in the US because even though it happens all over the world, it's so strange here how it's front and center. I think in 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 other places it's not so in your face. You know, and and that's really unfortunate. That's the unfortunate thing about it that you know, people walk into a room and their identity is one of the initial things that people make judgments on, etc. And so we need to move to a place where we can really try and get to know people as people rather than as identities. And of course, people say when you understand an identity, you can prepare for a conversation, right? You know, okay, what is the general kind of background on this person? But I think even though we have those generalities, we should probably try and face each person as an individual. And so I don't think You know, there are things that me being a black woman, you know, from Africa, raised in different countries, bring to a a table. But I try to make my humanity be the thing that stands out. And so even a white male privileged went to Harvard, I can still interact and engage with him as a human being, somebody that also has has struggles. And just because people think that you're privileged doesn't mean you don't have depression. It doesn't mean that your wife may not be cheating on you. Like there are a whole bunch of things that it doesn't matter that we're at, that's the human endeavor and the human experience. That is what we need to tap into more rather than identity. What is next for you? 
Right. Next for me is trying to do more local projects. Um, I really, I've decided Arizona is my home. So um, it's been great exploring the world, but I think you make impact where you live. Um, people should be able to walk around my house and see that I've done stuff in my neighborhood to see that I've done stuff for the local community. So I really want to do a lot more of that on, on the one side. And then on the other side, I re I've really started realizing and homing in on my gift, my gift of speaking, my gift of communication. And so I want to utilize that and, and do a lot more for that. And I think, you know, like it's, it's a, it's a privilege and an honor to really realize what your gift is and lean into your gift. Yes, we have weaknesses we should work on, but let's lean into our gifts and I want to do more with the gifts that I have been given. So as we close things out, you know, how do you encourage people who, I mean, you strike me as a really a fearless woman, <laughs> um, but how do you encourage people to, uh, to, to lean into that gift? You yeah, know, I mean, not everyone feels as fearless. I mean, life right. can be daunting and a variety of things can bat you down. So, so true. Um, my favorite quote that my mom says to me all the time is, fear is a habit. So she said to me, I remember when I first started doing presentations and talks, one time in 2011, I had a big conference I was organizing in Nigeria and I was up all night shaking, scared. I was just like, I can't do this. My mom stayed up with me all night. And she said, you're just used to being afraid. It's now become this habit that you just set yourself up all the time to have this feeling. She said, once you start seeing fear as a habit rather than something innate or something that is unchangeable, you can work towards breaking that habit of, of fear. And so that's basically what I do. When I feel fearful, the first thing I say is, are you actually, what is it that you're actually afraid of? Or is it just that you're so used to, okay, I'm about to do this, I feel afraid, or is there something else? If there's something else, then you can go and address that issue. If it's just the habit, you can say to yourself, I've done this a billion times, so I don't need to be afraid. And let me just break that habit. So that for me is something really, really powerful. But secondly, we're always going to have fear and, and realizing that sometimes fear might mean that you're doing something good. Because if you have no feeling and no emotion, then you may not value what you're doing. Mm. So trying to tap into the fear as this means that I'm pushing myself, this means that I'm doing something good might be something helpful to have too. I mean, I honestly could sit with you for hours. I don't know if it's what you're saying, how you're saying it, the accent. I mean, all <laughs> things combined, but you are a truly exceptional person and human being. And thank you so much for being here with us today and, and sharing your expertise and sharing your heart going beyond expertise, right? We're talking about sharing the heart. Yeah. So thank, thank you, you, thank so, you much. so much. And thank you for allowing me to call you Timmy rather than um, doctor and the whole formal <laughs> approach that just shows how cool you are. Thank you. We appreciate having you here. And thanks to all of you for listening and watching. I'm Carrie Pena. Let's talk now about what we heard. Brett Helgeson, the CEO of Adopt Technologies, is here with us in studio. Thanks for coming down. Thanks for having me. And, and sponsoring this podcast, we wanted to bring a podcast to light that uh, focuses on diversity and inspiration in tech. And that interview definitely signifies all of those things. I would say so. First and foremost, that is the coolest title ever, the African space lawyer. Right. I absolutely love it. <laughs> Secondly, she said something that totally resonates with me. She talks about her accent and how so many people love her accent. Well, my partner is South South African, our CTO, Ryan. And I remember one time specifically bringing him into a meeting with a prospective client and the client just was absolutely adoring and admiring. And I think he helped us close the deal. So it was wonderful. <laughs> Her accent definitely is something uh, magnetic, but so too is the person that she is. Unbelievably accomplished at such a young age and incredibly inspiring just to listen to the hurdles she's overcome, but ultimately go through that exploration of what she really wants to do in life. And then finding this incredible neat niche from the time that her dad brought her to NASA, not even knowing that that was ultimately going to be something that she's involved in, the exploration of space and how to potentially 
go create an economy through space exploration. What was the main takeaway for, for you? So another thing is the way that she talks about us being our own barriers to success and essentially the self-limiting prophecy that goes along with that, right? And her, the way that she ultimately said, hey, when I walk into a room, there's no reason that I can't be the one that everybody walks away remembering when I go into this room and just bringing her talents and her skills and confidence and then just being the best that she could possibly be. How does listening to her interview inspire you as a leader, a leader of a major tech company, Adopt, Adopt Technologies, how does that inspire you? Well, it inspires me in a number of ways. One of the biggest things is to her point that nothing is impossible. Um, but also what really also resonated with me is that we have to set aside all prejudices and thought processes and really focus on understanding where people are coming from. So the ability to sit down and just say, just tell me more about why you think that way or how you've come to that conclusion and not, and not prejudging, just focusing on putting yourself in their shoes and just learning. When you do that, it's amazing what would happen in the world if we just actually listened to others and showed that kind of love and respect. This is why you wanted to sponsor this podcast series, correct? Absolutely. I mean, incredible guests. Brett, thank you so much for being here as always. And thanks to all of you for listening and watching. I'm Carrie Pena.